I hope you understand how lucky you are to be here. Singularity University changed my life um, eight years ago. I've started building things that I had never dreamt of, and I hope you feel compelled to do the same when you leave on the third day here. April 15, 1986. A baby girl is born in a private hospital in the Dominican Republic. That same day, in that same country, 31 babies died. 28 babies died in a public hospital. May 5, 1986, the baby gets registered and she gets a birth certificate. So that means she will have access to, first of all, she has a name, she has an identity, she's a person, and she will have access to education and to social security. But that same day, 532 babies didn't get registered. So in our systems, 35% of the people born that, day, born that day, they don't exist for us. From the moment that baby is born, every major life event will be impacted and determined by government policies. Government policies will determine the life that this baby has and her opportunities to thrive. Why? Because governments are the biggest decision makers in the world. They run the public sector mostly inefficiently, so public services that you and I rely on uh, in, a daily, in a daily basis from um, road infrastructure, clean water, good sanitation systems, they don't quite work. In 18% of the world, these systems either don't work, don't work all the time, or they just don't work for all of us. We know we need to leapfrog poor governance. But where do we start? We have some ideas. One of the most powerful ways that governments make decisions today is by allocating public funds behind the initiatives and projects that they want to see happen in the world. This is called public procurement, and it's a $12 trillion global industry that is outdated, inaccessible, and very slow. Some of the specific problems of public procurement is that it's convoluted with policies. Sometimes they're contradicting with each other. Um, the processes are obsolete and sometimes not standardized. So same, the same people, when they go through different departments and different agencies, they need to do things differently. It requires manual implementation by a highly specialized workforce. Um, it poses one of the highest barriers of entries for small and medium businesses that are the backbones of our economies. And it simply represents too much from our budgets. Between 15 to 20 percent of our budgets of our money is simply not working for all of us. We know money is power. So if we have to start somewhere changing governments, let's start there. So enter social glass. We are creating a software ecosystem for governments uh, using artificial intelligence to digitize, streamline, and scale good processes and decision making, starting with public procurement. We like to say it is like a suite of products. It provides seam seamless interface. You can use one product, use the other. You don't have to download every product again and again because you know, you're familiarized with them. They have the same user experience. And we want to thank that this can become the tech infrastructure for modern governance. The first product that we're experimenting with is a government marketplace that allows governments to make a fully compliant, fast and paperless purchase without bids or paperwork from verified and cura curated government suppliers. The way it works is pretty simple. Um, governments can search, sort, add to cart and pay, click, click, click. It runs in the cloud, no training required. The software does all the admin legwork, making sure that we're aggregating millions of data points uh, that are unmatched by humans, like this supplier performed last time, or this one uh, got into default, but we know we can do better because of this X, Y reason. 
Uh, it's, uh, it has a very clean interface, so it's uncluttered, no ads, no distractions. And most importantly, it becomes this central hub, this place, this marketplace, where government entities can discover new suppliers and where for the first time in history, we think, a small business can start selling to government with simple three steps. We have a larger vision that is to simplify every single government operation. But we need to start somewhere. And we're starting with what we call micro-purchases. We're starting with micro-purchases, and I want you to learn this term because we think it's the beginning of the revolution of how governments are using money. We want to start with micro-purchases because they are an overlooked type of transaction. Because it's such a do low dollar amount, typically under $10,000 in the United States, we don't pay attention to them. But when you aggregate all of this, it accounts about, for about 10% of our government budgets. It's a $150 billion market only in the United States. Micro-purchases have many different names, forms, categories. In some countries, micro-purchases are a reimbursement receipt, a credit card swi swipe, a pink slip, Sometimes they go under the big bucket called miscellaneous, if you guys are familiar with that big bucket. Um, we know that they're made by staffers, interns, almost anybody that can get that hold of that credit card. Um, but most importantly, they're, they're done in a just-in-time fashion, uh, buying anything from daily needs to emergency services for things that were unexpected, unexpected unforeseen, and mostly unplanned. I have a big question here. Um, who has ever prepared a yearly budget? Raise your hands so to see if you guys are following. OK, leave your hands up. Who has executed this budget to perfection? <laughs> OK, so what are the odds that governments experience this same challenge? Exactly. So we think that doing small improvements at the small scale, the micro-purchase scale, can go into creating massive positive change that impacts governments. Um, this is where we want to harness the powers of 10 and the system of exponentials. A graspable example, the US government does 160 million credit card transactions per year. If we identified with a piece of software every transaction and saved only $1, we would save $160 million, which is the GDP of three small countries I can think of right now. If we routed 15% of those transactions, we could make one purchase a year from every single small business in the United States. This is the power of looking at the little things. So artificial intelligence has a huge opportunity here that is to help us identify optimize and create an impact into the things that are often overlooked. We know that today we can start adjusting our budgets in a just-in-time fashion. We can plan better. We can aggregate pricing data. We can match performance reviews, understanding which suppliers are better for what type of agency. We can optimize to buy from this small business or this women-owned business or this uh, veteran-owned business. And we basically can start making better public deals on behalf of all of us, of our taxpayers' money. But we know we can do more than that. We know that artificial intelligence allows us to create some more breakthroughs in the government sphere. In the last year, only by collecting data of how governments operate and observing certain operations, certain things that nobody's paying attention to, we've discovered two key things. Number one, that we can enable a performance-based government system because we can change what we can see. So how do we know if our governments are performing well? Well, we can do massive data ingestion, recording every single big and government decision, and we can build a robust decision-making and prediction model, understanding which decisions outperform which ones and which ones basically achieved their expected goal. This led to the second breakthrough that is a little bit more controversial, more contrarian, but we're in Silicon Valley. So I'm going to tell you what we've discovered. We've discovered that we could 
enable profit-generating government systems in a pretty simple way, actually. So if a system is identifying superior options and making better decisions, and every time it can shorten something or optimize something, it's basically making the system run more efficient over time, we, at some point, will have less operational costs and start putting that money, those savings, into having better public services. So we think that this could enable a new model where public services managed by governments are best in class, high quality, its use is highly encouraged, and are revenue generating so it can self-sustain the operations of the agencies providing these services. The terms profitable and public are controversial here because we cannot fully describe the new with all concepts. Specifically, the concept of public, we will need to understand better the cost structure. What does it take to provide an excellent, out-of-the-world, mind-blowing public service? But what we do know is that this piece of software running in every government agency is going to be an enabler. It's going to start using big data to analyze every government operation. It will identify opportunities to streamline recurrent decision making and reducing operating costs. It's going to suggest some revenue generating recommendations. Suggest, it's not going to make the decision. It's going to suggest that to the human that can augment that decision. And it's going to continuously use a self-learning formula to calculate trade-offs just in real time, visually. Government services are 13% more expensive than the services that the market provides. I think you can see it here. So the question is, if we can improve with AI all these processes, and because we are constantly improving them, the current cost can go into a minimal possible cost. And then the margin and the profit that we make out of reducing the operational cost of these services, we can allocate it into providing better services. This is an algorithm that we've been working on and that we think that by using AI to identify and maximize this efficiency, what we call this margin, it will really unlock the opportunity for us to power every single government solution in the world. We know that changing an economic model can definitely transform the way certain industries operate, especially how people at, at the bottom operate, and create some incentives for this type of people. Um, there is this uh, organization called Kiva.org. I don't know if you guys are familiar with it. Um, and they exchange charity money for uh, microloans. Basically, they've uh, uh, facilitated 1.6 million loans to low-income people, and they have a 96% 96, 96 repayment uh, rate. But if you think about this, what they've really done is that they've given the dignity to someone to enter a place, an office, to put their name and sign a contract and to say, I'm committing to pay this loan because you believe that I have something of value and because you believe that I am worth it, that I have the capacity. So what Kiva has done with this change in the economic model is basically created the capacity for these people to pay. And that is what a change in the model does to the people. It transforms the way they think of themselves, and it transforms what they can do. We think that with this AI algorithm, we can allow governments to self-transform. We want them to become these uh, super intelligent entities. That's the way we call them. And with this performance-based approach, we think that we can make better data-driven solutions, augmented by humans, have more accountability, and eliminate some external agents. So in a system where an external agent doesn't understand how something operates, comes and goes every four years, and is not accountable for any outcome on the public service, that external agent should have no space and no say in a government room. We also think that by enabling governments to be profit-generating, 
we can uh, allow agencies to have sustainable operations, provide excellent public services, and create public best value for, um, on behalf of all of us. Um, and maybe what this leads is, to, is into an idea whose time has come, that is the opportunity to separate governance from politics, or perception of what's happening from the fact and the data of what's really happening. Technology alone cannot accomplish this mission. Uh, we already know this because AI and computing systems, they continue the trajectory that they've been programmed to continue to, to do. And um, I like to think of it as you know, computers and AI systems, they see the world as it is, not as it could be. And this is where we need humans. We need creative humans and people with orthogonal thinking coming and optimizing for what these AI systems should be thinking or what they should be looking for. One of my favorite Silicon Valley startups, they do something brilliant. They basically have trained an AI to identify candidates that are lacking a little bit, that are lacking something in the skill set that they're looking. And the AI ranks um, these uh, candidates higher. Um, so the AI can do that. But who asks the AI to optimize for looking for someone and allowing that individual to create the skills that they need so they can succeed? Who trains the AI to lift up, to step up, to elevate someone? We do. Um, and this is the beautiful synergy that we can have when we merge men and machines working together so we can take all of our systems to the next level. That's what I learned at SU eight years ago. I learned to think, to ask a lot of questions, to make a lot of mistakes, to fail very often, every day, every hour, a failure. But most of all, because I was learning and doing many things, I enable myself to create some world's first. Uh, one of the world's first drone delivery companies, the world's first drone delivery operation over a city flying over people, the first drone regulation in the United States, the first public-private partnership to allow a Hyperloop system to operate in the United States, and so on. So what Singularity has given me is this understanding that I can exercise my power to create the world that I want to live in, that I think we deserve. Now, the new quest is to power every government with category-defining solutions that set the standard for what outstanding good governance is and that can close the gap between those countries that are well-managed and those countries that are centuries behind. I think that we need an exponential leap in governance. I think we can do that exponential leap in governance because when nobody thought we could do exponential leap in transportation, we were doing that with Matternet. We did that um, a couple of years ago, starting in 2011. This is one of those early drone delivery systems. And I think it's time to do it again with the next system. So thank you. <laughs>